So just a few verses to begin with in Jeremiah 16. And the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, and thou shalt not have sons nor daughters in this place. For thus says Jehovah concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that beget them in this land, they shall die of painful death. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried. They shall be as dung upon the face of the ground, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their carcasses shall be food for the fall of the heavens and for the beasts of the earth. I'll stop here. We will continue in a few moments. As we have seen, Jeremiah was a prophet for a very difficult time, and the Lord equipped him, we have seen it in Jeremiah 1, with very special qualities to bring the message and to be an instrument fit for the Master's use, sustained by the Lord. And even this great prophet Jeremiah, he uh, failed at some times. And we have seen some of this failure in chapter 15, where he complained and even uh, seemed to, to accuse God. We have seen it in chapter 15, verse 18. Will thou be altogether unto me as a treacherous spring, as waters that fail? That was a suggestion that was not right. But that we see how Jeremiah uh, sometimes was very discouraged. And then the Lord uh, spoke to him, we've seen it in Jeremiah 15 verse 19, Therefore thus says Jehovah, if thou return, Jeremiah needed to be, re to be brought back in true fellowship with God. That implied also a separation from this evil people among whom he found himself. And then he would have a ministry again. We talked about that the last time. Now, chapter 16 uh, shows us another object lesson. We have seen that uh, Jeremiah um, was uh, commanded to take that linen girdle, and we talked about that the last time in Jeremiah 13, and what followed was all connected with that. Now we come to Jeremiah's lifestyle. This is um, very solemn, that this command that came to him. It implies self-denial, not to take a wife. Why not? Well, because children who would be um, begotten and born, they would die painful deaths. So there were six reasons for Jeremiah not to get married. And if people would ask him, in those days, everyone, every man normally was married. So they would ask Jeremiah, why are not getting married? And so then he would tell them the reason. And that would speak to them then very powerfully. And in that connection there was also two more commands. He should not enter into the house of wailing. So if somebody would die and they would bury him, then he was not supposed to go to the house of wailing. And in a little village where he was living in Anatoth, not far from Jerusalem, everybody knew each other, everybody would notice that, hey, this man does not come, uh, and why not? And so he would again speak to them. And the, the message of the Lord, in verse 5 we read, um, where God says, Enter not into the house of wailing, neither go to lament or bemoan them, for I have taken away my peace from these people, says Jehovah the loving kindness and the tender mercy. So God had taken peace away, his loving kindness, that is a very powerful word that is used many times in the Old Testament that shows God's uh, compassion towards his people and his mercies, he would take that away. And both great and small shall die in this land, they shall not be buried, and none shall lament for them or cut themselves. That was a pagan practice, we know from uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy that the people was not supposed to do that but even in the days of uh, Elijah we see that uh, the prophets they cut themselves and or they made themselves bald and that was all pagan customs in connection connected with idolatry and in verse 7 in that connection that he should not go to the house of wailing uh, nor break bread for them in mourning to comfort them for the dead, 
uh, not take the cup of consolations to drink for their father or for their mother. That was a custom to do. But Jeremiah was not supposed to do that. That's the command. And so people would ask him again, why are you not doing that? What is that? Now a little parenthesis here, it is striking that the Lord Jesus took this custom to break bread and to drink the cup he took it and then he transformed it to what we know, the Lord's Supper. He instituted that in uh, Luke. We can see that in Luke 22. It's very touching. But here, Jeremiah could not do that. Because these people, they died a death under God's judgment. And um, it was a very sad situation. So he could not join them in these customs nor in the customs of feasting. In verse 8, Thou shalt not go into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and to drink. So, that is another side of uh, social um, events that are very common. And in a little village like that, everyone would participate in a wedding. It was custom. And so they would ask, but Why, Jeremiah, are not coming to this feast? He would say, Verse 9, For thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place before your eyes and your days, and in your days, the voice of mirth and voice of joy, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. That was the reason. And this was a solemn warning. It was still um, the day that they were in the land, and it could still be turned around. It, would still, it was still possible that judgment would not come. We see that till the very end. But here we see then Jeremiah was like an object lesson for the people. The fact that he would not go to the house of wailing or nor to the house of feasting should speak to them. Why is this? What does that mean? What should we do? What should we learn from that? But they did not take any lessons. It did not sink in. And that is why Jeremiah was sometimes discouraged. He was speaking that judgment was coming. And he sp that went on for about 40 years. I think he is in, about in the middle of his ministry. Those false prophets, they said judgment is not coming. And they seemed to be right because it was not coming. And Jeremiah was saying it is coming. So that was uh, also a reason that he was sometimes discouraged. But we know God was going to send judgment. And so it is also today. People would think, well, you know, uh, this gospel message, that's nice, but that's for my neighbor, it's not for me. He, this person is greatly mistaken. It's now the day of grace. Today, the day of salvation, not tomorrow. And it's very solemn to think about it. I, I don't know everyone here, I know most of you, but if there is someone who is not really at peace with God who has not found this peace at the feet of the Savior now is the time, not tomorrow because if you postpone it will be too late I know many very solemn stories about that that people postponed and then it was too late in verse 11 we see then that the Lord says Okay, I'll read from verse 10. It shall come to pass when thou shalt declare unto these people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore has Jehovah pronounced all this great evil against us? So here is the response. So they, they, they come to Jeremiah and ask this question. What is our iniquity and what is our sin which we have committed against Jehovah our Lord? So somehow they understood something was going on and so they asked this question. What should Jeremiah answer? Verse 11, Then shalt thou say to them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, says Jehovah, and have walked after other gods, have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And you, ye have done still worse than your fathers. And there ye are walking everyone after the stubbornness of his evil heart. This is the history of Israel. A generation, generation after generation, they hardened themselves. It's like Pharaoh in Egypt. There were so many plagues that came. And he hardened himself again and again. Till the Lord hardened him. And now we see God's own people, the descendants of Abram, in the promised land. And they are marked by hardening. 
stubbornness. And that shows, and we'll see that in chapter 17, the wickedness of the human heart. They're stubborn. And uh, we see this uh, summarized by Stephen. If you want to make a note of that and read Acts 7. In Acts 7 you see how Stephen shows this stubbornness, this hardening from the time they were in Egypt, in the land, uh, in the wilderness, in the land, and then even rejecting and um, putting to death their own Messiah. That is stubbornness. And then the message of grace came to them from heaven and they still didn't want to listen. And as a result of this hardening, God says in verse 13, I will cast you forth out of this land. That's a very solemn uh, warning. Into a land that he know not. This literally happened to the king. If you turn with me to chapter 22, you see this uh, repeated in Jeremiah 22. See, there were the, the sons of um, Josiah. Uh, we have seen in chapter 1, Jeremiah was prophesying under Josiah. And then Josiah uh, died uh, an early death. And then his sons became king, one after the other. The first one was uh, replaced by Je Jehoiakim, the second son. And then Jehoiakim, he... Um, probably was killed in a revolt and his body was thrown over the wall. But his son, Coniah, that is now the point in chapter 22, verse 24. As I live, says Jehovah, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were a signet upon my right hand, yet will I pluck thee thence. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them before whom thou art afraid, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into the hand of the Chaldeans. Verse 26, that is not the point why I want to read this passage. I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bare thee into another country where ye were not born, and there shall ye die. So this is a very solemn warning. Uh, in the note, if you have a Darby translation, you see that the, the Konaya, the name means how thou wilt sigh. And he had also other names, Jeconiah. His father was Jehoiakim, a very wicked king, but a godly name. His son had a godly name, Jeconiah, the Lord will establish, or something like that. And also Jehoiakim. And so this young king, he only reigned for three months, he was then de deported to Babylon with his mother. And why was this? Verse 27. Into the land where until they lift up their souls to return, thither shall they not return. Is this man, Konaya or Konya, a despised broken vessel? A vessel wherein is no delight? Wherefore are they thrown out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, 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 hear the word of Jehovah. Thus says, says Jehovah, write this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. This shows how solemn this judgment was that came over this generation. They had hardened themselves, God would cast them out of the country, and from his descendants there could not be a man sitting on the throne of David. Perhaps you know that Joseph, we find in Matthew 1, was a descendant of this Coniah. And so the Lord Jesus could not be on the throne because he was the, the, the son or adopted son of, um, of Joseph because of this uh, verdict. But the Lord Jesus would be a king because he came from another line, from Solomon, and through Mary, his mother, as you find in Luke 3. Very interesting. But this shows how uh, difficult the situation was, how uh, God could only uh, bring the most severe judgment because of their condition. And this is an application for us, uh, a lesson for us, if we harden ourselves, God's going to deal with us. And then in Jeremiah 16, to go back to chapter 16 now, what is God going to do despite 
this judgment that will come over them. Because God will fulfill his plans. And that is now in verse 14, Jeremiah 16, verse 14. Therefore, behold, days are coming, says Jehovah, that it shall no more be said as Jehovah lives, who brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Verse 15, but as Jehovah lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land to the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. For I will bring them again into their land, which I gave unto their fathers. So God is faithful. He's going to fulfill his promises. And that's explained in verse 16 and 17 also. But God is also a righteous God and he will uh, recompense their sin. Verse uh, 18. And that leads Jeremiah then to a prayer in verse 19. Jehovah, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of distress, and to thee shall the nations come from the ends of the earth, and they shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited falsehood and vanity, and in these things there is no profit. So Jeremiah uh, was really um, also affected by these things. But he knew that what the people was doing was totally wrong. And that's why he says in verse 20, Shall a man make gods unto himself? And they are no gods. Therefore behold, what the Lord says. He answers uh, Jeremiah's prayer. I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might. And they shall know that my name is Jehovah. Jehovah means who is. So the Lord is faithful. He is who he is. And he will be who he will be, and so you can count on him. But the condition of the people was so bad that it's described now in chapter 17, and that's why I want to uh, uh, take chapter 16 and 17 together in this connection, because it describes the wicked condition of the people. It was like um, their wickedness was engraven upon the tablet of their heart. Now, if you think about it, in the New Testament we see that the law, also in Exodus 31, the law was written by the finger of God on stone tablets. And also this second giving of the law was written on tablets of stone. But in 2 Corinthians 3, uh, Paul refers to that, that for the believers now in the day of grace, not the law is written on the tablets of their heart. Christ is written on the tablets of their heart. And in the world to come, for, uh, for um, the Jews, the law will be written on the tablets of their heart. So God is going to fulfill his plans, as we saw earlier. And so he will also not only bring them back into their land, he will also change them inwardly. So God is going to bring them back, number one. God is also to change them inwardly, number two. And that is uh, what we will see uh, later, but also here in chapter 17, uh, indicated in connection with this condition. This condition is so bad, the heart's condition is so bad, it takes a new birth. It takes a radical change. And verse 2 it gives some details while their children remember their altars and their asherahs by the green tree so that shows how they were plunged into idolatry and they had uh, despised God's rights verse 3 my mountain and so on but the result is that there will be judgment and God's anger will burn forever at the end of verse 4 in that connection now, we see what God says about this condition. Cursed is the man that confides in man. That's what the people was doing. That is, in the New Testament also, when the Lord was uh, preaching to them, they were putting the trust in man. They were honoring man more than God. You can see that with the Sadducees, you can see it with the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, they were honoring man above honoring God. And they put, therefore, trust in man. And make flesh his arm. That is verse 5b. Uh, they confide in man and make flesh his arm. Uh, they relied, also here the, king, the kings of Judah, they relied on Egypt for help. Or they relied on Babylon for help. They put their trust in man. In their own people. Or in people outside the land. They put their trust in man. And that is what is condemned here. Cursed is the man that confides in man. 
And that's a solemn lesson for us too. We always need to put our trust in the Lord. Not even in princes, not even in, um, in the chief brethren. We can only put our trust in the Lord. But in this case they put their trust in man and made flesh their arm. So they really expected everything to come from man. And they departed from the Lord. The result is in verse 6, He shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but he shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, a salt land and not inhabit it. That is very solemn. But then in contrast to that, what do we see in verse 7? And that speaks to each one of us here too. How can you be blessed? By putting your trust in the Lord. The word blessed implies that you go a straight path. By going a straight path, putting your trust in the Lord, you are blessed, you are happy. And that is, you confide in the Lord, you put your trust in Him. A very well known verse that we often read, also for couples that get married, in Proverbs 3 verse 5, but it is a verse that we need to remind ourselves of constantly, but in Proverbs 3 verse uh, 5, confide in Jehovah, put your trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own intelligence or understanding and then you put your trust in man if you do that you put your trust in yourself you put your trust in man instead of putting your trust in the Lord rely on the Lord verse 6 in all thy ways acknowledge him so whatever the situation is, whatever decision you have to make, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will make plain thy path. So he will direct us then. If we put our trust in the Lord, he will lead us, he will direct us. That's a promise. And so then you are blessed. That's what this verse, verse says. One more verse in Proverbs 16 verse 20. It's um, also a beautiful verse about this confidence. Um, he that gives heed to the word shall find good and whoso confides in Jehovah happy is he so here we see this same picture you want to be happy put your trust in the Lord and also pay attention to his word then you, f you shall find good that's what the people did not do they did not um, pay attention to God's word they did not trust the Lord and so they were cursed now here is very practical for us too to be blessed is by paying attention to God's word and putting our trust in him it says here in uh, Jeremiah 16 verse 7 and whose confidence Jehovah is now a New Testament example of one very briefly who put his trust in the Lord is Saul of Tarsus he had put his trust in himself you can read in Philippians 3 was a man who was very well known among the Jewish leadership he put his trust in himself, he put his trust in man. But then he learned to put his trust in the Lord. When he met the Lord Jesus on the way to Damascus, from that moment on, he was marked by the, by the fact that he trusted only the Lord. And in Philippians 3, the chapter that you could take note of to read further, there are two statements, or one statement that I want to read. It's not only Paul that put his trust in the Lord. He says in Philippians 3, verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and do not trust in flesh. But that is negative. You do not trust in flesh. Okay, first, we are the circumcision. That is, we are those who have judged the flesh. Set aside the flesh. According to God's thoughts. Positively, we worship through the Spirit of God. In our prayer also we emphasize the need to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Even our worship is in the power of the Spirit of God. Everything we can do as believers needs to be done in the power of the Spirit of God. That goes together with boasting in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always draw our attention to the Lord Jesus as He is now in the glory. Christ the anointed in heaven. Jesus in heaven there. We boast in Him. We glorify in Him. And we do not trust in the flesh. That goes together with the first point, we are the circumcision. Now, doing this, Paul himself could say in chapter 4, verse 13, I have strength for all things. 
through him or in him that gives me power. So he put his trust in the Lord and then he was an instrument fit for the master's use. To the ma for the master to use him, the power that he would provide. So here we see how chapter 3 verse 3 and chapter 4 verse 13 go together. What Paul says in general in chapter 3 verse 3, he experienced himself in chapter 4 verse 13 as an object lesson for us. So this, is, this speaks to us. Here to go back now to Jeremiah 17 verse um, 7, blessed is the man that confides in Jehovah. That is something that we need to do ongoing, all the time. You can say, well, I trusted the Lord when I got saved. Praise the Lord. But now we need to continue to trust Him for everything, for every decision, for every way we need to go. The result is, if we do that in uh, Jeremiah uh, 17 verse 8, For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. So if you do that, what verse 7 says, you are compared with a tree. And there are five points I briefly summarize. The tree is planted, that is its position, by the waters. We as believers are often compared uh, with a tree. And the tree needs to be planted in the right environment, by the waters. And so it's very practical for us also to make sure we draw what we need from the waters of the word. The second point is that spreads out its roots. So there is progress, there is growth. The roots get deeper. The tree uh, grows, but the roots get deeper. And that is important for all of us, uh, young and old, to grow. I was talking with a brother last week and he said his wife was not reading the scriptures anymore and she was not doing well. It's just one example that easily happened. We need to strengthen ourselves in the Lord, in His Word, in order to be strong, in order to um, grow. And Paul says in Ephesians, I'll just read it, you don't have to turn to it, but how important this is um, to, to grow in order that we may no longer be babes tossed and carried about by every wind of the teaching which is in the slight of men in, in principled cunning with view of systematized error. That is Satan's ways to try to lay hold of us. And he will succeed if we do not strengthen ourselves, if we remain babes, if we don't grow. But positively, he says, holding the truth in love, we may grow up to him in all things who is the head the Christ. Okay, this growing is so important. That is mentioned here in, uh, by Jeremiah and that spiritual growth is even much more elaborated in the New Testament and I just gave you one example. That will be another topic to study in detail. And then the third result is he shall not see when heat comes. That speaks in the scripture of trials and tribulations. Did you never have a trial or a tribulation yet? Well, be comforted, you'll get it. And tribulation make us grow. That is God's perspective. God is in control and He will allow tribulation. And that's the third point. When we strengthen ourselves, when we are planted by the waters, when we grow, then even when these things happen, even when the heat comes, His leaf shall remain green. So the fruit will not uh, be taken away. There will be results. And that is so beautiful to see this. Uh, God wants to strengthen us. If we have to go through tribulations and trials, He wants to strengthen through this. But before that happens, He wants us to grow, that we are strong, that we can face the enemy. And the first point, the fourth point here in Jeremiah 17 verse 8 is his leaf shall be green. So there is this fruitfulness. And in the year of drought, again, the thought of tribulation, and he can endure, he shall not be careful, or he shall not worry, neither shall he cease to yield fruit. So in adverse circumstances, in difficult circumstances, he still yields fruit. That is what God has in mind for us. That is what happened with Jeremiah. In very difficult circumstances, he still yielded fruit. Now why is this so important? Why do we need to strengthen ourselves and read the scriptures and grow? 
Verse 9 we see the heart is deceitful. The heart did not change. As long as we are here in this world, we have still the sin nature in us. And this heart is deceitful above all things. Even Jeremiah's heart. Even Paul's heart. We read about Paul in Philippians 3. And this heart is incurable. You read Romans 7 and Paul explains it in detail. That this is incurable. The flesh cannot be improved. You cannot change it for the good. It is incurable. That is God's verdict on it. And we better believe it. That is why we need to realize what the Lord says. The flesh profits nothing. We need to understand that that is the point. We need to say amen to that. And then he says even here in verse 9. Who can know it? God knows the hearts. But for us there are even uh, in our own hearts things that we cannot uh, really see. Um, and only God, for oh God we are an open book. But the heart, the human heart is deceitful above all things. Uh, when we study chapter 15, there was a verse uh, last time that I... Um, yeah, show, showed there to show that even Jeremiah was failing because he accused God in Jeremiah 15 verse 18 we saw that but I don't want to elaborate now on this this question by Jeremiah is answered in verse 10 Jeremiah 17 verse 10 I, Jehovah, search the heart so you don't have to search the depths of your heart we just, we will see this with the clay we need to make ourselves available to the Lord we need to be really uh, in his hand and just surrender everything then he will take care of everything I Jehovah search the heart so who can know it well we don't know it but God knows it and on top of that he searches it out uh, you read Psalm 139 and you see how God knows everything you cannot hide anything um, sometimes you may do something and think well nobody sees it well, you may kid yourself, you can kid the brethren, but you cannot kid the Lord. Jehovah searches the heart. Even a prophet like Samuel was reminded by the Lord. When he had to uh, anoint one of the sons of Jesse, he came and saw the oldest one, uh, tall like King Saul. He thought, that's the one. And God says, don't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And so even Samuel needed to realize this Jehovah he searches the heart he knows the heart and not only that he tests us we know from Hebrews 4 that the word of God he, it searches us out so in that sense we need to apply the word of God to understand what that searching means God searches the heart but he wants us to be in tune with God so that we would allow the word of God to search us out you read Hebrews 4 verse 12 and onward. It's a very solemn passage. Nothing can be hidden for God. But this is for our good. And he tries the reins, that is the kidneys. It is connected with discernment. He is the one who tests the reins. So he tests everything. If we say we, we will do it and we don't do it, God will bring, will test it and we, we will reveal it, how wrong we are. And that is connected with the, the last point here, even to give each one according to his ways. God is the God of retribution. I said earlier, you cannot hide anything for God, but that's not the whole story. God is also going to deal with us. If we hide something for God, God is going to deal with it. That is God's moral government. And in Galatians 6 verse 7 is a very important verse that we should not seduce ourselves by thinking that you can just do your own thing because God is going to deal with us so if you think well I can go along with I can go away with it I won't read the scriptures uh, it doesn't matter I will be okay um, Galatians 6 verse 7 says be not deceived God is not mocked for whatever a man shall sow so whatever it is, whether it is you only want to make money, or whether it is you only want to be fam famous, or whether it is you only want to enjoy sports, or whatever it is, um, 
Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man shall sow, that also shall he reap. That is a rule in God's uh, moral government. And so he gives two examples in verse 8. For he that sows to his own flesh shall reap corruption from the flesh. But if he sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit shall reap eternal life. It does not mean that you then only receive eternal life. We receive eternal life the moment we believe. But to enjoy it, we have to sow to the Spirit. That means we need to read the Word of God under the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need to listen to God's voice. And then we will enjoy this wonderful gift of eternal life. So that is a matter of God's government. Either you go along with God's thoughts and enjoy this fellowship, or you don't go along with God's thoughts, you reap the consequences. And that is the point here in Jeremiah 17 verse 10. Uh, even to give each one, there's no exception, each one is subject to this government of God. And it is according to your ways that you walk, it's according to the fruit of his doings. It's a very solemn statement. Now, I would like to connect that with chapter 18 and 19. We had in our hymn the thought of the potter and the clay. So when you turn to chapter 18, we see there uh, is another object lesson. I have this on the list, that is number 3, the potter's vessel. And that is especially in connection with the clay, the matter of the clay. In chapter 19, we'll just compare the two very briefly, you see the bottle, or the flagon, or flask, or pitcher, whatever name you want to give it, is the bottle. That is the result of this uh, process of the potter. There is a bottle. But we'll see the clay can still be molded, can still be changed. But once the bottle has gone through the fire, you cannot change it anymore. It will be broken. So there is a connection between the two chapters, but also a difference. So before we get to chapter 18, I wanted to read from chapter 17 one more verse. Um, the importance of uh, obe obeying is in verse 24. It shall come to pass if ye diligently hearken unto me, says Jehovah. So what we see here, God is going to fulfill his promises, as we saw earlier, but at the same time, it is only when the people will hearken to his voice. And that's a lesson for us too. God wants to bless us. But we don't, when we don't want to listen to his word, when we just want to do our own thing, then God cannot bless us in that sense. So now we come to chapter 18 where we see the potter. And Jeremiah had to go to the potter's house. And he saw him working on the wheel and, and uh, forming a vessel. The clay was uh, in his hand, but it was marred. The vessel was marred. So, what did the potter do? He made another vessel from the same clay, as it seemed good to the potter to make. That is chapter 18, verse 4. That is an illustration of God's sovereignty. God can make any vessel as He pleases. That is developed in Romans 9. If you want to take a note of that, in Romans 9... Uh, Paul shows that God is sovereign and God can do as He pleases. That principle can never be set aside. But there is another principle we will see. The clay, which is passive, has its own responsibility. That is why this, uh, uh, this is so difficult for us to understand. Uh, because some people say, well, you cannot do anything. God is sovereign. But what we see now in the clay... Verse 6, House of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, says Jehovah, behold, as the clay in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, house of Israel. So that again is the sight of God's sovereignty. He can just do as he pleases. But what makes it so difficult for us to understand, the clay has its own responsibility. The clay, um, that is really the people. And the people need to, to repent instead of continuing in their stubbornness of their heart. Look at verse 11. And now speak to the man of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Jehovah, Behold, I prepare 
evil against you. Now the word prepare here is the same as the word potters, the same root in the Hebrew. So I potter evil, it is I plan, I'm like the potter, God says, and I have everything in my hands and I prepare evil against you because of the disobedience as we've seen. And I devise a device against you. So that is God's side, His sovereignty, and He will deal with them. Now the clay, in the same verse, after the colon, turn ye then every one from his evil way and amend your ways and your doings. That's the clay. The clay cannot do anything, we would say. It's sub subject to the hands of the potter, yes. But what we see in this, uh, and we see that in many places in the scriptures, the clay is also responsible for itself. And that is why God says, repent. Of course, it's even more complex than that, because even if there is repentance, we know there is a work of God. So this is a very complex issue. If you study, make a few notes, read Romans 9 and also Ephesians 2 at the beginning. And then you see uh, how God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are connected. Only God can really fully see the mystery, how they are connected. But they are connected. And we see that already here in this clay. Sovereignty, God's sovereignty is there and it is maintained. At the same time, he says to the clay, turn ye everyone from his evil way. It's like, you know the parable in Luke 15, when uh, the, um, the, the woman lost uh, a coin, and then the, it, the coin cannot do anything. And then the Lord says, when the coin is found, so is each one who repents. How can that be? So there is this connection. On the one hand, it cannot do anything. On the other hand, it has its own responsibility. That's the point here with the clay. And so the Lord wants us to see the two lines together. The line of God's power and sovereignty. And He always acts in righteousness. And the line of man's responsibility. And because of man's failure, the repentance is needed. Here, for Israel, repentance was needed. And uh, that is repeated in many times in our own history and history of the church. That is the one side. When we come to the uh, chapter 19, you see the potter's vessel which was now broken. So there you have an other uh, application. Now it's not the clay that has been fashioned and then the potter is not satisfied so he, uh, he molds the clay again and starts over again. That you can do with clay. But when the clay has gone, the vessel has been prepared, it's gone through the oven, through the fire, then it becomes a bottle, then you cannot redo that process. And that is now the point in chapter 19. There we see, go and buy a potter's earthen flagon, or flask, or bottle. So again, there's a link with the potter, but it's a different scenario. Verse 2, go forth to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the pottery gate, and proclaim there the words that I shall tell thee. Now just a little background, this place, the valley of the son, son of Hinnom, that was the place where they burned the sacrifices to the idols. That is where even children were burned to death as a sacrifice to those evil gods. And that is in the Greek where the name Gehenna comes from, that is uh, hell. And so this is Gehenna, that is, comes from land of Hinnom. And that is this place where they practice these things. And because of these evil deeds, God is going to deal with them, as we see in verse 3 and onward. Verse 3, hear the word of Jehovah, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and which, the which whosoever hears his ear shall tingle. Why? Verse 4. Because they have forsaken me, and have estranged this place from me, and have burnt incense in it to other gods, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and have filled this place with the blood of innocence and have built the high place of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings. 
that's what I mentioned earlier, unto Baal, and also Moloch, we see from other places, which I commanded not, nor spake it, neither came it up into my mind. Therefore, verse 6, Behold, days come, says Jehovah, that this place shall no more be called Tophet. That was the name, and the Tophet means um, spitting or contempt, but that was the place of burning nor valley of the son of Hinnom, Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. So because of their evil deeds, God would call this valley the valley of slaughter. Why? Verse 7. I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hand of them that seek their life, and their carcasses will I give as food to the fall of the heavens and to the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city an astonishment and hissing. Everyone that passes by shall be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat everyone the flesh of his friend and the seeds, and in the straightness wherewith their enemies and they that seek their lives shall straighten them. This was fulfilled in the year AD, AD 70, the year after uh, 70 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Literally they did these things. It happened also in the siege of Samaria in 2 Kings uh, 7. But uh, here you see the fulfillment of what Moses had already predicted. You can read it in Deuteronomy 4 and in Deuteronomy 28 that Moses had literally said the same things, that these things would happen. And because they had hardened themselves so much, they would be like this vessel smashed and broken. Read on in verse 10. Thou shalt break the flagon or the bottle in the sight of the man. So this is connected with this object lesson. Because of the hardening the, the, of the people, the bottle would be broken. Verse 11, And go with thee and shall say unto them, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. You remember what we said? The clay could be reused again, it could be molded again, and another vessel could be made. But this vessel that had gone through the, the fire had become a vessel, could only be broken. There was no repentance, they did not change their mind, and so it could only be broken. There's a psalm verse in Proverbs 29, verse 1, If a man hardens himself, despite warnings, all of a sudden he will be broken. And what happens then, the same verse says, And they shall bury in Tophet, till there be no place to bury. This literally happened in the year 70. And this is going to happen in the future again. Verse 12, Thus will I do unto this place, says Jehovah, and to the inhabitants thereof, and make this city as Tophet, and the houses of Jerusalem. As I said earlier, Tophet means spitting or contempt, that was that was going to be the city. The whole city, Jerusalem, would be Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be as the place of Tophet defiled. All the houses upon whose roofs they have burned incense into all the hosts of the heavens and have poured out drink offerings unto other gods. That is the history of Israel. In the history of the church, it's sad to say, we see the same kind of idolatry, perhaps not as blatant that children are burned literally to death, but in the Western world, terrible things are happening, and God is going to bring judgment over the Western world. In verse 14, well, I just want to read on, verse 14, Jeremiah came from Tophet, whither Jehovah had sent him to prophesy, and he stood in the court of Jehovah's house and said to all the people, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city and upon all her cities all the evil that I have spoken against it, for they have hardened their necks not to hear my words. That is a very solemn verdict. Whereas in the hymn that we sang, we have prayed, have thine own way, Lord. So there the desire is that we will be like this clay that the potter can use for his own purpose, for his own glory. But when we harden ourselves, like these people did, of course these were unbelievers, but still, we as believers can also harden ourselves, and then we will have to face God's 
dealings. God will not be passive uh, when we harden ourselves. And as a result of this message, we see then that in chapter 20, that's connected with it, Pashur, he put Jeremiah in the stocks in verse 2. And because of that, the next day, Jeremiah calls him Magor Misabib, that is, terror on all sides. This was a nickname for Jeremiah. They called Jeremiah Magor Misabib. He's always talking about terror that's coming, and it did not come. And so that is why this priest, one of the temple police, put Jeremiah in, in jail for that night. But now he would be subject to this judgment that we were talking about earlier in chapter 19. He himself would fall under God's judgment. That was terrible. So if we harden ourselves, we see God is going to deal with us. God will act. He will not be passive. And it shows how these, in word of closing, these symbolic actions that Jeremiah uh, had to do really were very difficult for him to do. It was very hard. And he had a tremendous struggle. He went through tremendous struggles. But he was a faithful servant uh, after all. And so, Lord willing, the next time we may go to the yoke that he had to uh, carry, and then the yoke that was broken, uh, number five and six, go together. Another series of lessons, very solemn. But if there are questions left uh, in your mind that I did not uh, bring out, or things that were not clear, uh, please let's take a few moments for that. I know we, we covered a lot of ground, but if there is something that we would like to see clarified, uh, please uh, mention it. You said that uh, <coughs> uh, the Lord will write in, on the tablets of the heart the law again, but that will not happen before the great tribulation. No, that is after the great tribulation. After that is the new covenant. Yeah. Of course there will be a remnant in that sense on them God will write but as a nation it will be after the great tribulation when they turn to the Lord as we know from several scriptures. And even the return now to the promised land is all uh, in their own strength. Yeah. It's an unbelief. Uh, you, well we cannot say it isn't the work of the Lord but it is still in their own strength. Yeah. So they have returned in their own strength, although it is God's hand, yeah. that's for, for sure, but it's still in unbelief, although there is a remnant there right now also. Um, it's very interesting to study these things and see how close we are that God's plans will be fulfilled. They have, in that connection, in their own uh, ideas, they have reinstituted the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin that condemned the Lord in, in those days have now been reconvened, reinstituted, and they have done this because they have to make uh, regulations for the sacrifices, they want to bring sacrifices again uh, to rebuild the temple, but also to see whether a man who presents himself as the Messiah qualifies. So that is what man does. Man, in their self-will, in their self-knowledge, they rejected the true prince, and again, in their self-will, they will accept the false prince. That is very soon to happen. Uh, of course, after the rapture, but it's very close. And these chapters are rich in connection with prophecy, but they are also rich in connection with moral lessons for us even today, and even for the remnant in the future. The Word of God is very powerful. So may the Lord bless His Word, and if you have questions, we can talk afterwards also, and uh, may the Lord bless all of us.